Good morning, everyone, and happy Tuesday. My name is Taylor Lewis, and I am the Education Coordinator at the Edmonton Construction Association. On behalf of the Board of Directors and the ECA, we welcome you to the Carbon Reduction as Risk Mitigation Webinar. We are extremely happy to have with us today Kristen Tollefson and Stephanie Carter from EcoAmo, who will spend the next hour reviewing the upcoming changes to the construction industry surrounding carbon reduction and specifically how that can be used as a risk mitigation strategy for building owners and operators. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat section at the bottom of your screen as we have set aside time after the presentation to have them answered. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday morning. Um, myself and Stephanie are happy to partner with the ECA to deliver this presentation on carbon reduction as a risk mitigation strategy. And uh, mm -hmm. this is why we are here today, or how we are here today. Um, we are from EcoAmo. We coach high-performing teams to build high-performing buildings. Um, that has led to over 200 high performance building projects, over 230 lead projects, uh, with some of those projects over, or sorry, 17 of them being delivered by uh, the integrated project delivery method. Uh, we also um, are part of carbon monitoring and metering for events and for uh, businesses, and uh, are, can complete ESG, SDG reporting, embodied carbon analysis, or, or life cycle assessment, as we'll talk about coming up. and. Um, can help with climate adaptation and mitigation as well. And we actually just celebrated 15 years. Um, 2021 is our 15 year, but we just officially celebrated on Sunday. So June 6th was the day that Stephanie Carter started EcoAmo 15 years ago. So I'll let her introduce herself. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Stephanie, uh, owner as Kristen said, and um, yeah, just happy to be here where um, we, are happy to share information that we've collected over uh, the past while and, and very happy that MT Construction Association um, has some interest in this topic. And um, I wanna give a shout out to Kristen. Um, we're both very proud that we're um, newly appointed PMI ACPs. <laughs> Yeah, we had had to add that to the list right away as soon as, as soon as we as soon as that happened. Um, yeah, it's a, a agile methodology. So we're, uh, we're happy to, to add that to the list of things we can do and help out with our integrated project delivery. Um, yeah, my name's Kristen. I've been with EcoAmo since 2014. And um, I help with a lot of the green building certifications. We, we do do more than just lead. It's, you know, zero carbon and well and uh, living building challenge and uh, and a few others. So I help with that. And then also recently started um, doing the life cycle analysis for EcoAmo and starting that kind of carbon uh, carbon reduction information and strategy for EcoAmo itself. So let's get into our agenda for the day. Oh, sorry. I was just going to talk a little bit more about what we do. So um, yeah, you, you saw we build high performing teams to build high performing projects. And then one of the ways we do that is uh, we kind of I don't know, coined this phrase, uh, lean and green. So speaking of the PMI Agile and the IPD and, and uh, lean construction and our lean yellow belts and green belts, everyone at EcoAmo is a lean yellow belt. So we, um, we firmly believe that if you can take those efficiencies and take those things you've learned, reduce some waste, uh, especially on projects, um, hopefully some of those dollars, some of those time tokens can be spent on um, sustainability. So that's where we kind of hope that we can be lean and green to transition the world to sustainability. So, and then our agenda for the day, um, we'll go through the kind of the historical and global context. So really big picture, wanna set up why, why we're talking about carbon today, why it's so important to, to kind of become a, an everyday discussion in your projects and um, carbon reduction as the risk mitigation. And then we'll um, go a little bit deeper into how this could uh, affect you in Edmonton and Alberta and what's coming down the pipe. And then also um, how our industry is just being disrupted in general um, by these changes and these uh, changing climate and changing requirements from codes, et cetera. So we'll get right into it. And I think uh, Stephanie's gonna start us off with the historical context. Thanks, Kristen. Yep. So we just wanted to 
paint a little picture that I hadn't seen anyone do this before, but it kind of just shows, you know, the history of how we got here. And in uh, 1990 um, was one of the first IPCC reports that came out. And that was one of the only voices out there saying, hey, this is an issue. And then that inspired a whole suite of um, additional groups and additional focus focuses on how do we how do we make this happen and I'm specifically you know addressing or identifying the green building industry here but um, then three years later U.S. Green Building Council um, was founded um, or launched and then 1996 Passive House Institute and then in 2006 um, Architecture 2030 and Living Building Challenge so now we're getting a bit more aggressive um, and uh, I don't know if Anybody else remembers Ed Mazaria coming to town, coming to Edmonton in 2006 to inspire us and tell us all about how our jobs, going to our jobs every day, um, can make a positive impact if we chose to do so. And also at the same time, educating us on how big of an impact our, our industry has. Um, that was really key. Um, also the year I decided to flick the switch and start Equamo. <laughs> And then uh, 10 years later, uh, Paris Agreement was actually signed and C40 Cities was already around, but, but their focus and a big part of what they do now is, is related to the Paris Agreement and, and, um, and seeing that through. And of course, we have now also the World Green Building Council focusing on, on carbon reduction and um, there's step codes that have happened. Um, cities are starting to ban natural gas, which we'll talk about later. And there's a plethora of um, emission reduction certifications, which if Kristen goes to the next slide, this slide is, you don't, can't read it, obviously, but it's uh, just for impact to show just how many certifications uh, around the world in different parts of the world um, actually address carbon. And so it has definitely expanded from that first single voice back in IPCC all the way to now. And I believe the next um, section is, yeah, yeah um, it's the global context. So um, we uh, we wanted to just throw this in here because not everybody, I mean, you probably heard the word Paris Agreement, maybe you don't really know what it's all about, but, you know, it's about these um, um, 195 countries that came together to say, hey, we agree, this is an issue, let's try to do something. So. It's about emission reduction. It's about being transparent in that emission reduction so we can hold each other accountable. And it's about using market mechanisms that'll help us get there faster, which is like what we have here um, with our carbon tax. Go ahead, Kristen. Sure. Um, so we've uh, all 195 countries have agreed to all of this. How do we how do we get there? What does that mean when we agree to all these emission reductions? Um, and what's our timeline? So um, that means by 2020, we would have to have our peak global emissions. 2030, only eight or, or so years, years away, we have to half our global emissions. And then by 2050, we are hoping to be net zero global emissions. Um, and then we actually do need to go negative, which is a whole, whole thing of itself. But um, so in order to achieve that, we've we've broken that down also into percentages. And so to achieve that one and a half degree target, it's a reduction of 7.6% per year. Um, interestingly, as I'm sure most of us know, um, or have heard the stories about the global emissions being changed because of COVID. So there were estimates kind of early, early last year um, uh, that 8% reduction occurred in 2020. So while that's great and kind of sets us up, uh, of course, it's we're looking for that sustainable pace. We, uh, we need consecutive years of that happening. So it'll be interesting to see um, uh, what can happen post post pandemic. And then so now we know what our emissions reductions need to be by percent per year, that's just on a global level. And then this is why we're talking about buildings, um, why buildings have such a big impact and why, why we have such a huge opportunity to reduce those impacts. 40% uh, of all global carbon emissions are a result of the built environment. And then you can see that uh, 21, the yellow on the pie chart there is, um, is just building materials alone. 
So you've got your building operations, 28%, and then, and then your materials, your embodied carbon, um, making up the difference. So it's a, a building and the construction sector is a really, really huge factor in that reduction strategy. And that um, those that 8%, 7.6 reductions that are required throughout the consecutive years. Oops. Um, so uh, Canada realized this, they signed up for the Paris Agreement and they started their step code. So they did the Pan-Canadian framework and created this critical path to 2030. So you can see um, mostly it's just talking about um, more stringent energy codes, which we're already feeling the effects of, but that will that will be ramping up. This is you know published data that's going to happen. Um, and then it's not only just for, ex uh, sorry, new buildings and new construction, it's also for existing buildings. So we can't forget that. We'll, we'll continue to talk about that throughout our presentation today, but we can't meet those targets without retrofitting existing buildings as well. These, these goals are, um, of the Paris Agreement are not to be met just by, just by new construction alone. And then we'll go to global response and Stephanie. Thank you. So this is how the, the world has responded. So again, um, you know, going back to Architecture 2030 and Ed Mazaria, um, he really, you know, painted a picture of, for us of how cities are important. And, you know, um, they kind of have this nice niche of um, being able to talk directly to constituents and, and businesses and, and, and make um, legislature or, or bylaws that can really make a, a, a change quickly, um, quicker than other levels of government. So, um, and, and also, you know, the percent of global energy consumption that they represent is, is huge. Um, next slide. Sorry, my internet, I believe is frozen. Sorry if I have a funny face. <laughs> Uh, so the C40 cities, as we mentioned earlier, um, there are now 97 uh, affiliated cities, which represents 25% of global GDP. Um, so there's definitely a response from cities to acknowledge their opportunity in, in contributing to this um, reduction process. Next slide. Another... Um, trend that we're seeing globally is that um, with this carbon um, reduction agreement with Paris Agreement, part of that agreement was the mechanism, the market mechanism, some sort of carbon tax or um, emissions trading scheme. And, and as this image shows, it is definitely growing around the world. Next slide. And just to give you some examples of like what some specific cities, of course, are doing, we've all heard about how green, um, City of Vancouver is and the stuff that they're doing. They want to be the greenest city basically in the world, uh, which they're working on. Next slide. And they have already um, put out a lot of different um, statements about how they're addressing not only their operational carbon, but also their embodied carbon. Next slide. And um, their con Vancouver Regional Construction Association is committing to help engage and educate people through the ZEBX, Zero Emissions Building Exchange um, Initiative. Yeah, we're actually part of that in our Vancouver office. Very exciting. And then of course, um, New York on the other side of the continent, um, also doing a lot of um, reductions regarding and uh, the environment, but also um, carbon specifically. So New York has banned fossil fuels for new building projects. So can you imagine what that means for a designer? Yeah, that's okay, Kristen. And then they've also got their new um, carbon concrete policy, um, low carbon concrete policy. So again, they're looking at embodied carbon. And one of the biggest influences uh, in the last while has been actually the investment companies. You may have heard about this, but so BlackRock is one of the largest um, investment firms out there and, um, um, and financial, um, you know, they'll, they'll really choose what to invest their money in. And they have really turned a tide. Um, they're committed to helping 
reach this goal of carbon reduction and net zero. And they have come out with um, statements that align with the message of this presentation, which are um, climate risk is investment risk. So they're recognizing that if we don't do something, then there's going to be a lot more costs for um, building owners and investors. And so it's, it's now um, more risky to just not do anything. Next slide. And BlackRock is also represents um, asset managers and um, they're one of the largest and they have put climate at the center of their investment strategy. Next slide. And that led to a bunch of asset managers getting together to say, hey, we want to, just like the Paris Agreement, you know, have this kind of um, agreement where we all sign saying we're committed to managing our assets to reach these goals. And there is now um, a trend that says maybe some asset managers may not manage buildings if there aren't if they aren't going to be able to reach these goals. Another thing that happened in 2020, um, it was a very difficult year for a lot of of us, but um, on the environmental side, um, there was a sea change in the oil and gas sector. Um, if you go to basically every major oil and gas um, developer, they have now stated on their website that climate change is real and this is what they're doing about it. So um, instead of, um, in the past, there's been some misinformation. Now, all of them, you go to their website and we can, the links are in the the notes of the presentation, there is statements about how um, they are voluntarily uh, um, changing how they do business to contribute as well. So that's kind of the global side of things, but what's happening right here in, in Edmonton? And, um, you know, Edmonton itself um, is doing a lot to look reflectively at what Edmonton is currently doing, where do we stand and how do we, how can we mitigate this for um, our people and including tracking the temperature. So if you haven't already heard this message from them, uh, they track our local micro um, climate temperature and it has in fact increased over the years um, on an average um, percentage. So um, that affects us all and what, how that affects us is um, it's projected to be more drought, um, which then, I, you know, you might think, okay, warming, great, in Edmonton, boo, but actually um, that might mean, um, will, will probably mean that because we're going to have more droughts, then we might have more wildfires. That means our summers will be, again, more like a couple of years ago or where it was just smoke in the air for the whole summer. That's not fun when even though the temperature is warmer. And we'll also have more severe weather storms, so um, more flooding. Um, and it just means more extreme weather. It doesn't mean just nice, gentle warming. It means the Holocene is being affected in ways that we have never seen before. And, we, and it's expected to just be more extreme. Next slide. So the city of Edmonton has recognized this and they've put out their um, energy transition plan and they have their own, just like how um, the Paris Agreement um, uh, the, the federal government reacted and, and put out their Build Smart plan. The city of Edmonton has their own plan um, and how that spans between now and um, 2050. And obviously, again, um, codes are changing, but also they recognize there is a lot of existing buildings that we have to address. Next slide. So what they've done is, um, and this is, um, coming out actually on June 10th, the procedures will be live, but back in April 12th, they approved um, their new climate resilience policy, C627, which replaces C532, the old sustainable building policy, and C585, the energy transition strategy update, um, and their um, corporate policy framework. Um, so this Resilience policy has been out since April 12th, but what is rolling out um, in two days is all of these different procedures. So they've changed kind of how they work in the background. And instead of just having that one sustainable building policy that kind of is for all 
building types. Now they have a specific procedure for new design, existing buildings, acquisitions, leasing, and um, funded but not owned. So um, I'm sure all of us have felt how one size didn't quite fit all. So this should help with that. And it also shows that they're being very serious about their own carbon footprint in all of the ways that they affect um, the built environment. What does that actually mean though? It means they have a goal to be um, have emissions neutral buildings by 2040. And yes, that is new and existing buildings. And they have 700 existing buildings that have to be addressed in this way that they own. So all of this, of course, is still for the Edmonton um, owned buildings or Edmonton funded buildings. Um, it's, it's still, they're leading by example for the private sector. It's not yet required for the private sector, um, but that's what their goals are. And um, they also plan to require embodied carbon analysis or LCAs for new buildings as well. This next part of the presentation is the meat of what we were, um, I guess the, the title of the presentation, which is about how carbon reduction is um, mitigation strategy. And if you go to the next slide, um, the city of Edmonton has actually been leading in this area. Our little city, our northern climate city um, is actually uh, you know, pretty, pretty leading in the fact that they've taken it seriously what the percentage of carbon um, budget is for the globe and really tried to tangibly figure out what do we have to do. And so um, from the Paris Agreement, it was spelt out what the global carbon budget is. Edmonton figured out what our um, portion of that is. And next slide. And then some smart people at the Sage of Edmonton actually plotted this on a graph. And so um, this was done back in 2017. And from there, let's consider that peak, we had to have reduced our carbon emissions by 43% in 2020. I haven't seen any updates and I know there has been work on that, but um, definitely uh, I do not feel, my gut says that we've reached that 43%. And so the daunting task of getting to 81% by 2030 um, is a huge mountain to climb that we all must work together um, to reach. And of course, the message is just like the slide you saw earlier, that it's the same graph as, as um, the global community calculated that Kristen was talking about earlier. Um, it's quite steep. And um, if we don't do anything now, then it just is a steeper curve to reach these same goals later. So it becomes harder to do it later. And, um, and so the, this graph, this, this trajectory is true, whether that's our little, Edmonton, or whether it's some um, other, you know, billion person town um, in another part of the world, or um, a, a smaller community, the, the kind of trajectory is the same. We have to do a lot in the span of the decade. And now if we plot this all on um, a graph as far as how this affects our work and our clients' buildings. So, well, first let's put the, the goals down. So we have, by 2030, we have 81% emission reductions in Edmonton. Uh, and then um, as Kristen noted earlier, we have agreed to um, basically the world's off fossil fuels or it's maybe not the right wording, but it's um, emissions neutral by 2050 because um, we can't ever get off fossil fuels. I, I definitely think we're gonna have them forever in different ways, but it just, will be a bit more um, distributed between different types of energy and we'll still have plastics, et cetera. Um, so now let's put a building on there. So if uh, let's say we've been designing a building um, to these last couple of years and it, it will be constructed in 2021. If you hit the next button, Kristen. Um, so it's gonna be constructed in 2021. So we've already done the design, it's constructed now. So that means, um, in eight years, um, the emissions will have to be lowered. And then um, um, by 2050, of course, the emissions for that building has to just be um, neutral. And you can see for the life of the span of the project, all of this is very soon at the beginning of its lifespan. 
And um, so we need to address this now. And what can happen in between? If you hit the next button, um, so many things are happening in between that is now affecting um, whether this is risky to build conventionally or not. So as we already heard, investors are banning um, these um, fossil fuel opportunities. They're no longer investing in fossil So if you're trying to get funding for your building and it isn't an emissions re reduced building, you could have a tougher time. Um, carbon taxes, we already know that the uh, um, federal government has planned to um, triple carbon taxes. Um, the renewable energy has actually dropped dramatically in um, the last several years. And so that's more appealing to use on your buildings. Um, we've also heard that asset managers are, are now um, committing to managing carbon neutral buildings. So let's say if you built your building and you want to attract an asset manager to manage it, you might have a difficult time doing that. Um, natural gas prices have been low for a really long time, but that doesn't mean they're going to be that way forever. And there is some indication that um, that's changing already. And so um, that volatility in the utility prices is something becomes a risk for your client that we want to help to mitigate. So think of your own home. If you have a, a utility of a couple hundred bucks, pretty much all, you know, pretty steady. But then all of a sudden it become it balloons and becomes maybe a couple thousand bucks. That's that's dramatically different, and that's a risk that we want to mitigate for our clients. And by um, being an emissions neutral building, you have a much more ability to have a constant utility price. Um, and then again, these extreme weather events. So if you know there's flooding that happens, is your client prepared for that? Are they going to have to increase costs around um, maintaining and preventing um, what? could affect their building as far as these um, weather events. So all of these things, next, um, is pointing in the direction that it is our responsibility as design professionals to share these market changes with our clients in order to protect them from the financial risks. Um, if we don't, um, I don't feel like we're doing our complete job for them. Next slide. So in a sense, um, previously, you know, um, it was it felt comfortable or not risky to do conventional design because there wasn't a lot of um, things kind of flowing in the opposite direction. But now the tide has turned, and now there's many things, um, and so now this conventional building design, you're kind of actually going uphill or against the tide. So um, now, if you go to the next slide. It is, um, we've kind of reached a tipping point of what is considered risky and and now building an, an emissions neutral building or trying to um, reduce every year, but setting your building up, like selecting the right type of um, mechanical systems and building the envelope in a certain way to set your client up for success is, is now the less risky option. Next slide. Kristen will tell you about how this could affect your job. Uh, yeah, besides just to build on what Stephanie was talking about with that temperature increase there, um, besides you, know, you can see this fellow working in a heat wave alone, um, it, is, it is going to affect the type of buildings we'll have to build. So these are just some climate data we pulled specifically around Edmonton, just to give some numbers around that graph. Um, so yeah, in a high emission scenario, by 2051, we're looking at 7.3 uh, degrees hotter and also more rain. So yeah, it's, it seems counterintuitive, but yeah, the, the flood risk increases as well as the heat waves. So it's all, um, all coming to head with that extreme weather in general. And that, um, those photos are actually from job sites. So you may yourself have experienced some flooding like that or, or high heat waves and, you know, there's that actually affects our work. Like we have to stop and address those things. We have to make sure our people aren't overheating. We have to cost, pay more for, for removing the water on site. And, and, then, and again, as professionals, it's really good for us to understand what's happening. And so that, if you just go back to that last slide, Kristen, that slide, um, this resource, climatedata.ca, is free and it's open. You can collect a whole bunch of different um, data on any town, no matter how small it is across Canada. Um, 
sorry, I was just thinking about, yeah, we had that happen this year. There was a flood for a project in Fort McMurray and obviously set the schedule back. And then of course they're just recovering from fires as well. So just it's, it's happening. Um, these are the heat temperature, again, just another temperature graph to show, but then also on the other side that the number of frost days are going down as well. So again, that might seem like a good thing, but uh, um, that extreme weather scenario is not, not where we wanna be. Um, I know I thought this previously, I thought we were a little insulated in Canada and that we wouldn't be actually um, as, as um, impacted by, by these changes to the climate, just, you know, being in a northern bubble, maybe we don't make as many emissions as China or the US, etc. But in fact, we're, we're feeling the effects more than, um, more than many people in the world, many areas in the world. So Canada two times the rate and northern Canada three times the rate. So it's actually the you know, the further north we're going, the more affected you are by these, um, by these changes. So, so while we kind of look at global data, we want to make sure to put on that Canada lens and really see that it actually, we're probably going to be having to think about these things again, earlier, always earlier. So just wanted to And, and Edmonton is one of the more northern, northern um, major cities in Canada. Um, I believe that's partially why they've addressed this, because we're going to be impacted faster. Uh, this is just another highlight of how those insurance and that extreme um, that extreme weather um, uh, events for projects and, and for buildings are already occurring. So um, this is this is um, data from the states, but just to show that percent of GDP that it, that it is happening and the insurance it's it's there. It's already being tracked through those insurance losses. So um, um, it's here and it's only increasing. And this is a crazy slide to me. Just that's the billion dollar weather disasters in 2020 alone. So only in one year, each circle is a billion dollars spent on an extreme recovery from an extreme weather event. So um, again, I know, know that's data from the States, but, um, but we know we're feeling those effects as well. And so some cities, uh, back to the kind of the cities and how they're able to maybe implement some laws and, and um, respond to climate change potentially a bit faster than the federal or uh, level. Uh, cities are starting to ban natural gas. We saw for New York and then I believe in California as well, that started to happen in a few places and they're promoting electrification. Um, again, we know this is from the States and data from the US, but we do also follow them for a lot of trends. Um, so. California and Washington leading leading as well. Um, so they're they're statewide and then there's local. So you can see some of the some of the places are already starting to make those changes. And now we're back into the pie charts of the of the breakdowns. Why why buildings? Why why do we need to keep? Um, why do we have this huge opportunity? Um, so this is a breakdown from the World Green Building Council. Uh, operationally, that's our carbon. So 28%, that's just to keep all the buildings that currently exist in the world running is 28% of our emissions. Um, embodied carbon, which we'll start getting into more and more here in the rest of the presentation, that's the part that's typically not been addressed. So that's where we're starting to go. And that's kind of where we're talking about this presentation today is we wanna start talking about that 11%. And I do think it's very interesting. This 11% comprises um, you know, concrete, steel, aluminum, but that whole section is 22.7. Um, so you might be thinking, oh, it's only 11%. Maybe we wanna focus on other areas, but in fact, um, as the building and construction industry, you can see on the bottom right hand side there, if we're demanding more from our suppliers, we're demanding more from that supply chain, low carbon options, we have that ability to affect the 22.7% and, um, you know, the concrete being supplied to infrastructure, transportation, you know, you're building cars, you're building roads, etc. So you have an opportunity uh, as an industry to affect other areas, not just our own. So I, I do think that's great that the materials, you know, they don't know a sector, they, they just go um, where they're needed. And I know, I think I just heard a talk from the Canada Green Building Council that concrete is the second most consumed resource in the world after water. So I know just, just thinking of things like that really put it into perspective for me. And then this is just the, um, that 11%, again, so that's all the new buildings while the 28% is the existing building. So we're only building more. So these are the stats from the UN environment and from Architecture 2030. Um, these ones from um, the UN. So you can see the building stock is going to double by 2060. 
And my favorite little stat is that we're building a new 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 York City once every 34 days. It's it's um, it's insane, and that's not just Manhattan. That's all of it. The five the whole five boroughs. So I think it's like 5.8 billion square feet or something like that. So that's happening, and that's going to happen every month for the next 40 years. So it's not stopping. Um, and so we have a huge responsibility and ability to build those new buildings um, to be net zero. Emitting, and so then this is just taking that piece of the pie for just um, building operations and embodied carbon alone, and trying to just talk about buildings. And so architecture twenty thirty is split it up. So um, just to discuss again that energy modeling, we've I think we've been getting you know really good at that. We're starting to understand where our changes can be made, and we're getting more stringent codes. So that's what's been addressing the building operations portion. And the part that we haven't been really addressing yet is the is the embodied carbon from from building materials. And so that's where we get into the life cycle assessments. That's analogous to the energy modeling. So that's we want that equivalency and want to start reporting on both to make sure we're capturing the entire carbon um, emissions for a building. And uh, sorry, I'll just go back for a second. You can see it says it's a embodied carbon is a quarter of annual building sector emissions and growing. So why, why would it grow? Why would this change? Uh, why would the pie chart get larger for embodied carbon. Um, now they're saying it's almost half, you know, that previous pie chart was from a couple of years ago. Now we're at almost half. And that's because the, um, we're getting better at our energy modeling. So we've starting to address our energy efficiencies. So that's the gray. And then what ends up happening is as we get more and more efficient, the gray becomes smaller, but the, our embodied carbon becomes that much more important. So it does just become a, a larger, a larger piece of a smaller pie. You can see we are we are reducing the circles getting smaller, but that embodied carbon piece is sitting there waiting for us to 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 be addressed. So um, I think that's really I, I just I love this visual. It just shows the importance. And then another reason that the embodied part uh, carbon importance grows is that um, it, it has to do with our grid. So the carbon intensity of our grid. So Canada is much lower sitting, we're sitting lower than the rest of the world. So you can imagine that for Canada, if our grid intensity is lower, this gray portion only gets smaller and our embodied carbon again is already more important in Canada. So just wanting to put that Canadian lens on a few of these slides because um, it's uh, easy to, to overlook. And- But that is of course the mix of Canada. So we have our hydro and yes. BC and, and, um, and uh, uh, Quebec, but, um, as professionals, this is another thing for us to know as um, is what is our, our own grid um, primary energy makeup for emissions and whether you're a large company and you have projects across Canada, knowing that um, primary energy is going to be part of the language that we'll share as we um, move through our work. Agreed. Yeah, I want to put that Canadian lens on on any any data we're seeing around, you know, circles or, or pie charts about embodied carbon. So in Canada, we want to focus on it more. And then we have our Alberta numbers. So Alberta is sitting nicely at the top with respect to uh, uh, the the Canadian carbon intensity of the grid. Um, and then you might think, well, this is just showing how much more important operational carbon is. And it, and it is, we don't wanna forget it. And I think the important piece of where it comes back into the embodied carbon is, embodied carbon is those materials. So um, it's using that electricity, it's using those fossil fuels to make the materials. So it goes further down the supply chain. So, so what's being um, used to make that material also affects the embodied carbon emissions as well. So, so they do go um, hand in hand. And our favorite question, what is embodied carbon? Um, there's no great definition. This is one of the better ones I've seen. The total impacts of all greenhouse gases emitted by the construction and materials of our built environment. And uh, it captures the impacts of the sourcing, manufacturing, transportation, and, and any waste. And of course, any maintenance and repairs along the way. Um, yeah, this just really wants to Put the life cycle and life cycle assessment really so that's how you're capturing um, exactly what's covered by embodied carbon and you can see again the materials have a huge huge opportunity building materials have to um, reduce emissions 
Uh, this is again just going back to the building stock. So now we're not talking about new buildings, we're talking about existing buildings. So if you remember back from Stephanie's slide, we're already kind of building those buildings that will exist. So by 20, um, half of the buildings that will be in use in 2050 have already been built. So what we're already, you know, those are our retrofits, those are our, um, our that piece of the puzzle that we can't forget again. We can't just meet the, our targets by new buildings only. And that's what the federal government smart build plan addresses and also city of Edmonton plan is addressing both new build and existing buildings. And as, as pointed out, there's just so many buildings that are existing that we have to address. So our jobs will probably change from um, maybe not only focusing predominantly on new buildings, but um, focusing a lot on existing buildings. Yeah, I think it's going to be much, much more about retrofits in the future. It's it's the only way forward, um, or sorry, a large part of our way forward. And um, so the greenest building is the one that already exists. So of course, our carbon reduction potential is best if we're not building anything new. Uh, we know from that data, read really the new New York City every 40 days, or sorry, 34 days, that's not likely going to happen. So our next option is to build less. Um, Third for our reduction potential is to build clever. We're hoping everyone can be using low carbon materials and proper design and, um, and finally build efficiently. So we're gonna continue to use those technologies and eliminate waste. So always earlier, and you, you're, you'll hear us keep saying that a lot, the earlier we can plan for this, the earlier we can change, the better, better off we'll be. And that um, speaks back to our, our traditional kind of contract delivery method about where, where we're getting those kind of um, uh, ideals from about re reducing our carbon or who's who's requesting it who's asking for it and how is it actually being met we're finding that the the traditional way is great but we want to kind of go back to that lean and green where everyone's actually working together and um, supporting those targets and goals early so the owner has the goals and the carbon neutral goals and as team team members and project team members we can talk about those early in design and construction to make sure we're all on the same page for a, a target and a budget so this is another way that your job could change is that instead of a more conventional um, delivery, there will be something more collaborative because it's showing that we can get more, um, uh, we can reach our goals faster and at a lower cost or at least on budget um, in this delivery method versus the conventional one. And then I think Stephanie is going to this be next... talking about disruption. Thank you, yes. Um, so even if you've kind of been day to day, uh, you know, kind of doing the same thing, maybe you're working on working drawings and same details and the same stuff. Um, if you, you know, lift your head up and look at what the market is doing, there is a disruption happening. And a disruption is where there's multiple different um, factors converging all at once to impact um, a sector. And if you go to the next slide, I'll, kind of explain some of them. Um, so our industry is um, innovating, which is great because for like 200 years, uh, we have not really addressed our productivity, whereas other industries have. Um, manufacturing is almost three times more productive <laughs> than construction, but that's changing because we're addressing this um, inefficiency with Again, the collaborative delivery models or lean construction, prefabrication, automation, and AI. Um, and of course, we're infusing our buildings with technology and smart buildings, which is just making us even that much more educated and ability to reduce the operational um, uh, emissions. And um, so there's innovation happening in our sector, which um, some of us have felt. Um, and at the same time, there's all these other things happening. There's um, the building codes are changing, uh, step codes, there's um, regulation around climate. So we have carbon taxes and that um, should be factored into our life cycle costing analysis for our clients. Um, again, uh, natural gas prices, um, uncertainty around whether we'll stay at this low pricing. Um, some areas of the world are banning things like fracking um, and again, the renewables are reducing um, dramatically in cost. Um, efficiencies are improving. And, um, and then of course we have these um, weather events that um, are becoming insurance risks. We're having to think about that and think about how our clients are um, 
are affected by that via their building. So are we doing a climate risk analysis? Are we doing um, something to mitigate their risk um, by designing that into our design at the, be at the beginning? So all of these things are coming together and kind of converging and things are happening fast. Next slide. So the um, S curve of adoption of technology is actually getting steeper over time because we're just getting more ubiquitous with technology and the digitization of our world. So even though we have only eight years to reach some of these 2030 targets, I actually have um, a lot of optimism around the fact that we can utilize our technologies and utilize um, how we're working together to get there quicker, um, you know, even including as terrible as social media is, it allows us to share information as a community faster and so we can uptake different things that are working for different people. Next slide. And to give you a sense of before we're in this uh, day of the digital technology, quick, fast paced uptake, it still was pretty quick when there was a disruption. So this is an example of um, the car. So back in 1900, there was mostly um, horses in this image by uh, Tony Siba. Also his presentation, really great if you haven't seen it, Clean Disruption. Um, and of course there's one, one car and then only short 13 years later, like where's the horse? There's all cars. Um, so things can happen really quickly in a positive direction for Ford. But conversely, if you don't go with the tide in the next slide, um, Kodak unfortunately did not go with the the, the trend of the digital camera. And so in 2000, they had record revenue, like their best year yet. But then a short 12 years later filed for bankruptcy. So this can go quickly in the office direction. So we have to protect our clients from this scenario. And if you remember back earlier, we shared where 2020 was you know, a sea change and all of the oil and gas companies have now said that climate change is real, we're doing something about it. They put their own goals out there about how they're gonna reduce. Well, apparently uh, there's still risk in, in that scenario because as of March of this year, if you click, um, they uh, lost um, um, a court battle um, the Netherlands government has actually said, actually, we need you to reduce sooner. We need you to stop pulling oil out of the ground, and we need you to um, join us in this Paris Agreement and meet the goals that are um, for 2030 and and not the ones that you had said. So that's a landmark, um, um, I guess, ruling. And um, what the sense is, is that more of this kind of thing is going to happen the closer we get to the goal. So we don't want to be the laggards. We want to be leading in this area and, and um, educating our clients and making sure that they're, they're um, not gonna face a similar situation. Sorry, I was rushing you along there, Stephanie. Um, okay. Finally, so, you know, we're saying carbon reduction, carbon reduction, carbon reduction. How do you do it? Um, we've got some resources for you. So there's some, definitely some places to go and check out. Um, one of the conferences, Carbon Positive, I was lucky to attend just before the pandemic. Um, it was really great. And that's how I learned and met people to launch the Carbon Leadership Forum. The 2030 Palette is available, um, internet platform for guide, guiding principles as well. And um, those lovely carbon leadership people, and we'll give you their, their website at the bottom there, um, they've actually created a roadmap to reduction. So if you're ever like, how, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what this means for my project time schedules. Um, this, this, they have it all mapped out, you know, it's full. They've got um, amazing resources and, and uh, lots of, um, you know, how does my HVAC system change? Like questions like that, that people have asked before. And there's quite great forum discussions and um, resources and studies um, that are fully available on the internet through, through the carbon leadership. So this is just an example of one of those resources, but I think it's uh, fantastic to see um, how you can incorporate an LCA or life cycle assessment into your project schedule. And then finally, there's some other collaborations through the 2030 districts, again, going back to the cities. And then um, the World Green Building Council as well has started the advancing net zero. So um, there's lots of collaborations and things to be a part of or check out. Um, 
one major step that you'll see that we'll, we'll keep promoting is that all projects should start having a life cycle assessment similar to what the city of Edmonton has uh, started will will be starting to request. Um, so there's a few different ways you can do that. There's the Athena Impact um, free tool tally as well that can just um, plug right into Revit. One click is also falls right into Revit. Um, we've been using that for our, our life cycle assessments at EcoAmo and I quite, quite enjoy it. A little bit European based, but still, still covers off a lot of the materials. And finally, you might've heard of the zero carbon framework from um, the Canadian Green Building Council. And we just wanted to highlight that because I think a few people get scared when they see it and they're like, oh, my building won't meet that like, and just discredit it. But in fact, um, grid independence is not required. Um, they just hold you to a, a Teddy target and ask you to conduct an LCA. So um, just don't, just be aware that you can, you can just start with that reporting and that goal setting and that targeting. And that's usually the first path, um, the first step on your journey. You don't have to be um, net zero right away. Um, we're just hoping to, to set the standard and set the um, first step for getting there. Um, and to transition. So you make a plan over time to reduce do, yeah. over, over time. And then finally, there's another tool called the embodied, embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator. So if you're ever wondering how your materials are impacting your project, um, this free tool is available to everyone and can, um, can help you make some, maybe some more informed material decisions. And um, the Carbon Leadership Forum that I'm going to keep talking about because I'm trying to, I'm part of it and want to educate as many people about carbon as possible. Um, we're actually having a, an event next week that will, the founder of Change Labs and the developer of the EC3 tool is giving a, giving a chat about that. So um, a really great uh, uh, opener intro course into how we can start checking in on our materials. And then finally, I just encourage you to join up with the regional hubs. So again, this is the leadership forum that will have lots of um, resources for you and it is geographically based, um, but I know there's lots of great studies coming out of Washington University too, where the founder of the Carbon Leadership Forum is from. So um, lots of great information too about uh, you know refrigerants and mechanical systems. And there's so much that we still need to cover with uh, life cycle assessments, um, not just building materials alone, so. That's it for resources. So we just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us today. And we can uh, open it up to a few questions if anyone has any. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, um, there aren't any in the chat at the moment. So if you did have any questions, please go ahead and type them there. We got a thank you here for you. I'll just give you guys a couple minutes if someone's typing a question or finishing up there. Um, okay, so if there if there isn't any questions, uh, the presentation has been recorded. It will be distributed probably in the next couple of days. The video kind of just has to render and whatnot on the back end here. And then we will have that distributed to uh, everybody that was in attendance today. So Stephanie and Kristen, thank you very much. Um, we're very happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you.